Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the George Eastman Museum. My name is Emma Rathi. I'm the manager of programs and exhibition production here. Tonight's program is the second at the Eastman Museum presented in partnership with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Department of History at the University of Rochester. This program is funded in part by the Lewis S. and Molly B. Wolk Foundation. We have Dr. Robert Ehrenreich, Director of Academic Research and Dissemination at the United States Holocaust Memor Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, and Dr. Thomas Fleischman, Associate Professor of History and Director of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Rochester here with us this evening. Tonight, you are going to hear from renowned experts on the analysis of photographs of the Holocaust for research and teaching, and the advantages, disadvantages, and ethics of viewing atrocity imagery. There is a content notice that this presentation will include graphic images of violence. A little bit about our panelists. Professor Wendy Lauer serves as the director of the Magrublian Center for Human Rights, the John K. Roth Professor of History, and is a George R. Roberts Fellow at Claremont McKenna College in California. Lauer is a well-published author. Her book, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, was a finalist for the National Book Award and translated into 23 languages. Her book, The Ravine, A Family, a Photograph, a Holocaust Massacre Revealed, received the National Jewish Book Award at the Holocaust, in the Holocaust category. Dr. Valerie Hebert serves as acting chair and professor of history and interdisciplinary studies at Lakehead University in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Hebert has written about several important topics, including the Nuremberg trials and Rwanda's Gakacha tribunals, the place of Holocaust in the evolution of human rights law, and Holocaust photography. Hebert's edition, oh, Hebert's edited volume, Framing the Holocaust, examines a series of photographs documenting a mass shooting in Latvia. Following a brief presentation from Laura and Hebert, they'll be joined on the stage with our moderator tonight, Evan Dawson. Dawson is the host of WXXI's Connections and the NPR stations based in Rochester in the Finger Lakes. He brings 500 hours a year of live conversation to the community. Following tonight's discussion, I invite you all to join us in the Wolk Concourse for a reception and book signing. There are copies of Framing the Holocaust and the Ravine available for purchase in our museum shop. But now I would like to welcome Valerie Hebert to the podium. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be here. We've had, Wendy and I, I've had such a warm welcome here by the uh, George Eastman Museum, Emma and Eliza, and uh, speaking with curators. It's been just such a wonderful experience, and I'm so glad to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> we've gathered tonight to think about how atrocity images help us to understand traumatic history, particularly the history of the Holocaust. Now, quite apart from the harrowing things that these photographs depict, images as a source for knowledge are a challenging medium. Why? Because photographs keep secrets. This seems like a counterintuitive claim since all the content that an image possesses is right there in the frame for anyone to see. Photographs reflect our world in a recognizable way. They transmit information without the abstraction or intervention of language. They need no translation. What we see once was, therefore they seem an irrefutable, unmistakable kind of evidence. If only it were that simple. It's true that photographs speak no language, but the other side of this coin is that they are mute. They don't reveal the context of their creation, the identity of the photographer, nor do they name the person, place, time, or event that they show. And even when we can reconstruct much about this or that photograph's provenance, the image's meaning shifts and flips in relation to its origins and the subject positions of subsequent viewers. I recently published a collection of essays about a series of photographs that document a mass shooting <clears throat> that took place in December 1941 on a beach at a place called Shkeda in Latvia. 
their German police and their Latvian collaborators murdered 2,749 Jews, mainly women and children. One of the German shooters, we don't know precisely who, took 12 photographs on the first day of this three-day massacre. His images chronicle the sequential steps. And a superficial reading of these images suggests that they are process photographs, <clears throat> documenting key aspects of a well-organized operation. We see a group of people that has been brought to a holding area at the beach. We see people undressing. We see smaller groups being walked to the shooting site. We see them lined up facing the sea, their backs to the gunmen with a mass grave separating them. We see bodies lying dead. This photograph is the best known of the series. It appears frequently and often by itself in books, museum exhibits, films, and artworks about the Holocaust. From the time that the photograph was rediscovered in the Soviet archives, it has acquired the iconic status that the historian Cornelia Brink describes. It has been used as a kind of shorthand to articulate and demonstrate Nazi barbarity, to represent the so-called Holocaust by bullets, to symbolize the utter vulnerability of Jewish people under Nazi power. This reading of the image is not wrong. It's not a misrepresentation of the visual information in the photograph, but it is only a partial understanding of what the photograph documents. Just moving off that image to give a bit of relief, I'll return to it in a moment. Thinking about the photograph's creation, although we know that one of the German shooters took this and the other 11 pictures, we don't know why. The images were discussed in a few post-war trials of the men involved in the shooting. One witness testified that they were taken because there was a high-ranking military delegation present on that first day, and it was a special occasion of sorts, the implication being that this was uh, had a documentary motive to photograph it. Other people claim that the photographs were taken to, quote-unquote, prove that it was Latvians who were responsible for the shootings, because wherever we see men in uniform in the photographs, they are, in fact, Latvian. However, Six of the images, half of the series, focus on naked or partially clothed women. This to me suggests an unofficial personal mandate. Four of the photographs, a full third of the series, capture children in moments of terror, indica indicating another personal preoccupation. Moreover, that day on the beach, the photographer's project was an additional act of cruelty, separate from his task of mass murder. In four of the images, subjects appear to be aware of the photographer. There's eye contact. In at least five, he was close enough to the subjects that they most likely would have been aware of his presence, even if they didn't make eye contact with him. The camera, therefore, was the other weapon deployed that day. Taking their photograph was a degrading violation before their actual murder. As Mariana Hirsch observes, the people were shot twice. Now, the geometry of any photograph means that when we view the image, we occupy the same position that the photographer did. Therefore, we, in a sense, reenact the dynamic that turned victims into spectacles when we look at the photograph. Of the entire series, this photograph is the only one where we see someone trying to hide from the photographer. It's the little girl on the left. She was only 10 years old. Her hunched shoulders and bowed head remind us that while the photographer could compel her mother and her aunt and the two other women to cooperate with this handmade souvenir, he did not have their consent. It is a pointed and painful reminder that we have, willingly or not, become accomplices 
in the photographer's ruthless enterprise. What, therefore, justifies our presence here? Why should we look at this and the, and the other 11 photographs given their sordid origins and the risk of reanimating the original intrusive, exploitative gaze? This is the question that I discussed in my contribution to the book. And the arguments against looking at these photographs spring from the concerns I've just signaled. These photographs were taken without consent. They were driven by a hateful impulse to further humiliate and debase their subjects. They preserve in perpetuity both the perpetrator's violent gaze and the victim's humiliation. They celebrate, they titillate, they shock, they numb. They teach nothing worth knowing. Weighing in favor of continued engagement with these and similar images is that they individualize and personalize the otherwise abstract figure of six million. When we look at faces, when we restore names, we grasp at a deeper level the loss that this history represents. And in this way, the photographs serve a memorial function. They undermine the Nazi goal to erase the memory of Jewish life in Europe and to erase the evidence uh, of their destruction. Although I argue forcefully for looking at these images closely, carefully, I add a caveat. Justifying our engagement with these photographs does not lessen the pain of viewing them or redeem the victim's original anguish. So we must be committed and in and clear about our purpose here, which is to be open to all the evidence that brings us closer to the fullness of this history, to work toward truth. Photographs are essential to this purpose, though photographs themselves are silent and do not answer their own ethical challenge. The same photograph can be both the means to celebrate violence and the means to mourn those whom the violence claimed. This is the thought that I wanted to open with. The photograph tells us much less than we think it does and instead is better understood as an invitation to look long and think deeply. May we have the courage and fortitude to undertake that work. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you all for joining us tonight, and thank you to the Eastman Museum for a, a glorious day um, in the archives, in the collections, going through the house of George Eastman. This is just a, a gem, as you call it, <laughs> of an institution, and um, for all of you who live in Rochester, congratulations. Um, you know, it's interesting that you show that photo, uh, Valerie, this one here, because I made, uh, I make a lot of mistakes. One that, I, that stuck with me for a long time in teaching was showing this photograph about 20 years ago um, when I was just lecturing on these mobile killing units and kind of relating to the students how the Nazis came in and carried out this Holocaust by bullets, half the victims of the Holocaust, close to half of them were killed outside the gas chambers um, in these mass shooting operations and ghetto liquidations. And these are the victims that are very hard to uncover. In fact, half of the victims of the Holocaust in Ukraine, and we have about 1.4 million who died in Ukraine, mostly outside the camp system, have not been identified. So photos like this, when we come across them, and they're very rare, um, are super important sources for us to delve into to try to reconstruct that history. So um, we agree as far as <laughs> the, uh, the whole motive. But I showed this photograph in my class, and afterwards, a Jewish student came up to me and said, Professor Lauer, that could be my grandmother. And you didn't even talk about that family. You just kind of put it up on the screen and then off you went on, on the kind of the Nazi version or whatever, the Nazi perpetrator side of the history. So, you know, this is, um, this, these projects are really driven by a lot of different scholarly objectives, but um, at a very humane, kind of human um, uh, point of view or ethical point of view, it's about, you know, restoring the kinds of stories of, of the victims. So my story, um, and I'm, this is uh, another rather uh, disturbing image. This is actually, I'm gonna show you an image that came to my attention in 2009 as the basis of this book. And it's an action shot. It's actually depicting the act of murder 
Um, and most of the Holocaust photos that we have, photos of the Holocaust era, um, are showing Jews kind of before and after, um, but not the actual act of murder. So this photograph came to my attention at the Holocaust Museum in 2009, and it was brought to me from two Prague journalists who had found it in the archives in Prague and had not seen the light of day, and they were trying to figure out the who, what, where, when, you know, you know, reconstruct the history of this photograph. And they brought to me very key uh, pieces of information that kind of launched me in this kind of research journey. Number one, I had the date, October 13th, 1941. I had the location, which is Mirapol, Ukraine, not Mirapol, 20 Days in Mirapol, the film, but another, a shtetl actually 100 miles west of Kiev in the historic lands of the Pale of Settlement. And I had the name of the photographer. Uh, I actually had a testimony from the photographer. He was interrogated three times about his photos that he took, these incriminating photos. He was a Slovakian guard. And in his testimony, he identified the camera that he used as ice icon contacts. So I had that, you know, the material piece of it. I had the very basic kind of information so that I could start to, to dig deeper. Um, so what are we seeing in this photograph? Well, again, about perspective, um, I saw these shoes in the foreground. I was at the Holocaust Memorial <laughs> Museum. Down below me a few floors were shues that had been brought from the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum. It's a very important uh, metaphor for the absence of presence, the presence of absence, individuality of the victims, the loss. And here they are in the foreground. And am among, um, in the shoes, if you can zoom in and zoom out and see them, you can see bullet casings and kind of scraps of paper and um, start to piece together the story. It's taken in broad daylight, which is consistent with these mass shootings um, in the lands of the former Soviet Union. And the fact that um, the light is kind of coming through the trees in this way um, and seeing the way this, this uh, pit was dug, dug out then raises questions of environmental history. And so the photo also points us into that direction of what happens in these places that are people's hometowns. What happens to the soil over time? Can we go back to that crime scene and see evidence of changes in vegetation and changes in the landscape because the victims are clothed and they're um, inhumed in their clothing and that changes the composition of the landscape. Um, and who are these, these killers? Um, to see these German um, officials uh, shoulder to shoulder with Ukrainian collaborators and there's a man who's kind of witnessing it there with that, uh, that civilian with that cap. Um, this smoke here, as I said, this is an action shot and so we have this reality of the ballistics of what's happening here as far as um, the hovering of the smoke and the halo effect, which indicates that there were prior victims and that's why the smoke is there. Um, the position of the family in the center here, the, the woman um, and the two children in the center, a kind of rule of thirds, if you want to look at this more of a, as a constructed you know, image, the aesthetics of this horror. Of this horror. Um, it's, it's pornographic, um, the, the positioning of this woman and, and, and the guns, um, and that's the, another added layer of the obscenity of this. And um, here in the full image, you can see the Ukrainian man in the back, he's doing the firing, he has kind of a grimace uh, in his face and the way, way he's positioned. Um, and then I, I started to study in this image of collaboration um, the uniforms and try to figure out what is this German unit, you know, and what are the markings on the uniform, and, um, and similarly, what, why are these Ukrainians wearing Soviet coats, and they have these armbands, and what kinds of guns are they using? So it's taking this image and picking it apart and trying to really, you know, drill down and get down to the facts of, of what's happening. But the benefit, of course, was having the photographer's testimony, right? And your image, it's one of the missing pieces. And, and then you can try to understand why he was there and what motivated him to take the picture. And to my um, delight, actually, because I assumed that anyone with that model camera, um, which was patented in the early, uh, I think, 25, and then the second one was in 33. And this was the age of the camera craze. I don't need to tell people here at the Eastman Museum, but I also kind of explored the history of the development of these cameras and when they hit the consumer market and why would he have access to this camera, and he was a hobby photographer. So um, the photographer's name, this is his Slovakian testimony, Slovakian photographer, Ukrainian collaborator, policeman, 
German officials. This is part of the occupation when the Nazis rolled into the Soviet Union and invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. It was a Axis kind of co combined effort. Um, at this moment, historically, um, uh, Hitler was, was speaking with his Croatian ally, for instance, and saying he does not want any Jewish family to remain on the continent of Europe. He said that the, if you don't kill the entire family, then the offspring the, will, will rise up and avenge you know, the murders of their relatives, and this had to be final. So it's a crystallizing moment in Nazi decision making as far as what they called the final solution. Um, and so this Slovakian guard, this is Lubomir Skrovina, here he is with his camera, which he donated to the Museum for the History of Jews in Bratislava when, shortly before he died in 2005. Um, so he was the company's scribe, and uh, so he had that camera, and he was told to go check out what was going on. He overheard the shooting and the noise. Um, and it was actually not a kind of act of collaboration as such. He was taking it because he was resisting. He was taking it because it was his enough moment, his turning point at 25 years old. He didn't sign up for this war. He didn't want to be in it. He was apolitical. He was disgusted by the atrocities. Um, and so he took the picture so that when he went back to Bratislava, he was going to show it to the Jewish community and say, this is what's going to happen to you when you are called up for this deportation. Don't go. And he ended up hiding a Jewish family in his attic and helping with the resistance movement and Banska Bristritza. So, you know, until you do that research, you, there are a lot of kind of assumptions that can be, um, um, that one can, and a certain bias, right, that you have to um, test. Um, and it's just an illustration I wanted to show you of this kind of uh, culture of, uh, photography during the war. The Holocaust is the most visually documented genocide uh, we have on record. And in closing, um, the family unit is a part of the story um, uh, of, of not only the centerpiece of that image, but how we reconstruct the history, how the Nazis conceived of it kind of genealogically, root and branch genocide. Um, and in the memorial culture, this is a Yad Vashem page of testimony as I searched for the family on the chapter, The Missing Missing, I was never able to, with 100% with certainty, identify uh, that family in the photo. As you can see, it's, you know, it's very difficult because of the, you can't see their faces, and maybe there's that little boy. But this was really as close as I got. And this was a family that was killed on that day. Um, uh, there's an empty <laughs> space in the middle because the grandmother had already uh, passed. But this photo was taken in the summer of 1941. This is how this family that was massacred in Mirapol, Ukraine on October 13, 1941, how they wanted to be remembered. And so I just wanted to end with that photo. We'll welcome them to the stage now. I'm Evan Dawson from WXXI, and um, our intention now, and I'm going to be checking the clock because I know we're on a bit of a tight schedule and we could probably be here all night, uh, is to have what I think will be a productive conversation, and we'll try to open it up for some questions in the audience as well as, as time permits here. Um, there is really so much that stands out to me about this presentation, and I want to start by asking uh, both Valerie and Wendy, if if they want to talk a bit about um, how these kinds of presentations in the classroom, there are students here tonight, and um, you do such important work with students. If if these kinds of presentations, if if the reaction of students has evolved or changed, if, if there is any more concern raised, and then perhaps I mean I think as as Wendy described, sometimes the appropriate. Uh, stop and consider the context and how we're, we're teaching this. Um, and I want to ask in, in the context that says, I don't want to caricature the idea of trigger warnings or safe spaces. I think students have legitimate concerns about what they're being taught has relevance and need. But both of you feel that there is relevance and very much a need to see these images and to learn about them in context. So I want to start by asking if you have noticed any difference in how students are responding and how you work with them to make sure that they understand these images are vital to see as hard as it is. Um, <clears throat> I became interested in history through photographs first. It was my grandfather's time life <laughs> coffee table book of, of 
you know, these key historical photos. And um, what I realized when I often would, would use these kinds of images with my students, they didn't know them the same way. Um, and so they had no preconceived ideas around, you know, the relationship between photography and, and history. Um, but what I quickly realized instead was that um, photography is as a much more integrated part of their everyday experience than it was even for me. I mean, their social media is just, you know, they scroll through photos all day long. Um, and students, they are interested in contemporary questions and contemporary events. And I think of, you know, some of our recent, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement having been begun before George Floyd, but it was that footage that really uh, gave the um, energy and momentum to that, to that movement to spread. And so I think they understand intuitively this connection between the power of photography and, uh, you know, ways to think about articulating uh, contemporary questions. Um, but I think there is still a lot of work to be done in giving them to tool, the tools to understand the multi-layered meanings of any single photograph. Um, and to think that they, you know, they, they scroll through these photographs on, on social media and it's as if they sort of came out of nowhere, out of the ether. They're not attached to a person, they're not attached to a motive. Um, and they don't necessarily attach, you know, what, you know, how different communities might receive that, that, that photographic information differently, that it might, you know, ignite different sensitivities, different, you know, pain points. And so one of the things I've been working on with my students is not just sort of understanding, you know, the importance of these photographs to understanding particular histories, but just understanding what photographs do, how it is that they communicate what they can and can't tell us and how much responsibility we still have as viewers, um, consumers of these images to, to ask the, the questions, you know, that surround these images. Wendy? Yeah, um, it's, I think that the, as professors of history um, <clears throat> and being in the business of education, uh, increasingly taking on the charge of trying to develop better kind of visual literacy of our students given the predominance of images in the world and to just kind of develop their sensitivities to what they're looking at. And so I get into kind of exercises with them where they find an atrocity photograph from any major human rights violation and try to figure out all these questions and analyze it like a primary source document and understand that there's bias as far as the photographer. There are compositional elements, there's perspective, there's motion in the picture, there's directional motion in the picture, and pick apart, it's potentially cropped, you know, is it the full picture? Um, <clears throat> how far is the person standing away from the, from the event? You know, when was this picture taken? What was the possible technology? Was there a zoom lens available, right? Or is it a daguerreotype, you know? Like, what's, what's actually, <clears throat> being photographed, what could possibly be photographed, excuse me. <clears throat> and then also, the afterlives of these photos and the agency that, of, of these images, because they are inert, um, but they're, you know, they have this kind of effect, right? And they can be used in the courtroom. We're talking about images of atrocities. These are, this is evidence of crimes, right? What do you do when you find a picture that shows kind of an act of murder, whether it was 100 years ago, if it's a lynching image, or something that is contemporary. And you know, what is your responsibility with that image uh, in the present and you know, understanding it historically and placing it in its con proper context? Are there circumstances where you would allow students to opt out of seeing these images or having to write about them or respond or engage with them? I have offered that. I teach a, a two-semester-long course on the photography of human rights violations and international conflict, um, and so the, the scope is beyond Holocaust. And I have offered that, and I have yet to have a student take me up on the offer. And, you know, maybe it's a self-selecting group that takes that course, um, but I think the students have a much greater capacity for these difficult topics and this difficult imagery than we might assume. Okay. Same? Well, I would say it's interesting to think about <clears throat> the work of Sharon Slavinsky. He has a great book, and I'm not sure if it's in the bookstore here, but um, 
It's called Human Rights in Camera. And she talks about, you know, we're all spectators, and she talks about witnessing and how, you know, and how we um, not only develop a kind of empathy, but we're constantly, going back to Kant, um, developing this kind of moral sensibility and kind of sense of judgment of events happening over there. You know, if it's a photograph, say, for instance, of atrocities in Bucha or atrocities that Hamas committed. So how do we kind of, as a collective spectator community, respond to those images? Um, also, the fact that photography, the photographer himself has kind of, that profession has evolved in a way that we have these humanitarian photographers who self-identify as humanitarian photographers. So the profession has changed, you know, and that the power of images in this kind of struggle for human rights, for documenting crimes, but also in how we respond to them um, and that kind of ethical imperative. And so you really have to be, if it has that much power, that much potential, um, we have to get right what is in the image and what's happening, right, because of that value. And, and then how do you help all of us now contextualize images because there is a tremendous difference between Latvia in 1941 and now. I mean, it was, a, it was an act of, as we learn, resistance, um, but a great effort to take photographs and to then process them and be able to share them. And now you can share anything instantly. And we have seen mass shootings live streamed. We have seen images of atrocity show, and to your point about George Floyd, I can remember that summer a number of people in feeds that I was in saying, I have seen the video, please do not post it anymore. Please do not share it anymore. And I can understand that emotion. How do we act as more ethical citizens when imagery now is so easily accessed but often without context, in that quick scroll, quick scroll, and then quick share, how do we more ethically engage with occasionally running into true atrocity images, deep trauma that can cause wounds, especially without context? Valerie? It's a big question. It's a big question. Um, I don't think it's a question that's confined to the photograph. I mean, at, at the heart, I think the photograph is the gateway to the larger, well, we can have sort of two conversations about this, as, you know, like as researchers, as, as educators, what do we do with these photographs in our classroom? So it really is about showing this or that image and to what end and with what goal and, and what do we hope to achieve with it. But I think, you know, this whole, like, what is it to be ethical and responsible and to engage with that? Well, like, what is it to be an ethical, responsible citizen? <laughs> of our community, of our country, of our world. And I think that's what I think your question is sort of getting at, is just um, is there a measure for that? <laughs> like, is there a how-to to try and understand uh, an issue deeply and in its complexity? I think, you know, if, like the exercise of, of understanding what a photograph can tell us models that kind of complex thinking, that looking at it from many angles, trying to understand the motives of the photographer, the experience of the uh, subject, the positionality of the viewer. And in that way, I think it just, it, it models a way of thinking that I think would benefit the way we think about anything else, that even absent the photograph, how we might think of some contemporary crisis, or some, some contemporary social issue. Um, I, I think, you know, it's just a way of, of you know, to be, it takes a, a long time to get something right. And whether that's looking at a photograph or, or thinking about an issue, it's, it's, I think, you know, as much as social media has made us that much more a visual culture, it's also, I think, detrimentally shortened our attention span. Agreed. And that's the issue. It's not the photograph, it's the fact that we can just scroll past it. Mm -hmm. Well and it, it should call, so these photographs that do come out, like the little boy who was washed up on the beach, Alan mm -hmm. Curdy, you know, in the red t-shirt, and then it, then it galvanized Europeans, and then, you know, Angela <coughs> Merkel opened up the door to over a million Syrian refugees, like they, the, the power of these photographs, to really stop and look closely and think and reflect on what's happening and process that, and it's, and they become part of our collective consciousness and conscience, and 
Um, I don't, you know, I've been doing this for decades and I have yet to become numb or inured. And so this, this kind of idea that, you know, with repeated viewings, you know, you're gonna become desensitized um, is not the case. And in a way that kind of gives me hope and I, you know, and I'm an ordinary person. So I feel like everybody else probably, or most people, right? Um, they're also kind of absorbing this and it's, it's shaping their thinking. And, you know, for better or for worse, because it is, they are traumatic images. Um, and they, you know, the affect there is, is real. Um, not everybody, you know, can look at these photographs over long periods of time. I realize that. Um, not everybody's really um, going to choose to do that, really. Um, they're going to choose to look away. It's too much. So, um, but, you know, for those of us who really want to develop that literacy with the students and point out, you know, this is a responsible way of going about it and m trying to model that, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. Um, but they, they really are significant as far as change and um, affecting change. Another question that comes to mind for me, and this may be sort of in the category of big questions too, about how we, we interpret images. You know, I think about a 25-year-old man who had f felt like he had to do something and took those images in Latvia. And, and then, you know, I deeply appreciate understanding the course of his career, and I'm grateful to hear that. Um, that's a bit of, con you're right, I might have assumed that those images were a, a very, very different motivation. So, um, and so I can imagine a 25-year-old man thinking, I'm going to share with the world, where I'm going to try to use these images to help people, to help prevent more atrocity, to educate the world. And perhaps he'd be shocked in 2024 that there is still, um, we'll just take the Holocaust, still denialism, there's still, um, this, this obstinate uh, effort to rewrite history, despite these absolutely vital images as hard as they are to see. And then you could probably apply that to many other seemingly intractable conflicts that even with imagery, they don't seem to, to move as many people as I would expect. And maybe that's a commentary on the human condition or our epistemology and, and why we choose sides and aren't movable. But shouldn't imagery, if if viewed perhaps with context and education, at least give us a chance to more fully form beliefs and, and, and not just be team players that don't think critically? I think, and you know, Sharon Solinsky in her book, I mean, she, she traces the uh, evolution of human rights thinking and, and photography played such an important role in that, that it was, it was, photogra it was photographs of, uh, colonial atrocities. Some that we looked Congo. at today, yeah, of and, Fenton, of Brady, yeah. of these early war photographs, yeah, right. the ones from the Belgian Congo, right? The Kodak, the incorruptible Kodak, Kodak. Mark Twain said, you know? Yeah, that, that it, was, it was in seeing, because human rights, well, first of all, I mean, these photographs were able to articulate a kind of harm uh, around which we didn't have words, we didn't have discourse, we didn't have language around human rights, but we had these photographs. And, and one of, you know, her um, one of the best points or insights is that, you know, we don't recognize a human right when we're enjoying it. Like, I'm, I'm free right now, but I, there's nothing to see, right? We recognize photographs in their absence, right? And, and photo, um, human rights, we recognize human rights in their absence, and photographs are uniquely positioned to capture the absence of a human right, right? Because they can capture that violation, a person in chains, right? Or a person behind bars, or a, a dead body. Or a murder, yeah. Or a murder, right? And so, um, completely lost my train of thought. Yeah. So these photographs were coming out of these zones um, and communicating to you know the world what was happening and stirring up you know the Congo Reform Association, all these movements, um, and you know. So there's a wonderful history of that kind of. In, um, developing consciousness of, of what we're capable of in these images and the power of those images to convey human rights violations. And you know your rights are, you know your rights when they're violated, basically, is what you were saying. So um, they, they give us that kind of visual record. Now, um, one of the challenges today is that we all, all have very short memories. Like, it seems like events happen and then you know, they're suddenly forgotten, like with the news cycle and so forth. Um, and I think that the images also, there's great potential there to kind of be a quick kind of memory check <laughs> um, when, when the stories are not as, uh, you can't be kind of articulated. 
um, when, when, the, when the victims are gone, when the witnesses are gone, like what is going to speak to that event um, most immediately and most powerfully? I was mentioning to our guest that earlier this week I had an interview on the program with um, an author. He's 82 years old now, and he writes a lot about capitalism and as he sees them, the injuries of, of capitalism. And his work has, ran, has run decades, um, both as a professor and an author and an organizer. But he was uh, uh, 13 years old when Emmett Till was murdered. And he comes from a German immigrant family. He's the first uh, American born in his family. And his mother, at his, his age of 12, decided to show him Holocaust photography and thought she needed to contextualize it but give him the grounding to understand his own family loss, his own family tragedy, and then the, a broader story. And he said he always appreciated that about her, that she did not shy away from what she feared would be difficult for him, but helped contextualize it. And then she allowed him to see, at 13, the Emmett Till photograph. And he wrote in his recent book how grateful he was that Emmett Till's mother opened the casket and showed the world as hard as that was to see, as awful as that was to see. But today, I still understand people say, I don't want to see it or it shouldn't be shared. Are there contexts where, where atrocity imagery, I mean, should they only be in certain spaces? Should they not really be shared? And so, I mean, should, not that I don't want to overregulate or police, I'm more talking about norms and culture, but I mean, do we need to be especially careful in terms of the setting in which they could even be discovered and perceived and viewed? Yeah, um, I'd like to comment on that because I <clears throat> looked into this when I was um, preparing the book. Um, in this debate that Valerie mentioned about, you know, choosing to look, not to look, uh, what are the implications of that? Well, first of all, I, I systematically went through survivor testimony at the Shoah Foundation, the video testimony, and saw a pattern whereby survivors would, would um, put an atrocity photograph or something, you know, a Holocaust-related photograph, and put it in front of the camera and say, look, this is what happened to me. Don't look away, right? So there was, I felt like I had kind of permission from survivors to, to do that kind of work um, on that issue of looking and not looking and, and, and re-traumatization or kind of an, a double assault as far as bringing up these images. In 1988, with the Holocaust Museum's um, development of the Holocaust Museum opened in 1993. So you can imagine, um, as there, most of the exhibit in Washington, D.C. is photography, blown up photography, liberation photos of, of corpses, you know. Um, and so um, in 1988, when scholars and museologists deliberated the visual content of the USHMM exhibits, they explored the question of explicit imagery, including the pornography of murder, nudity, and violence in a museum. I'm quoting from an a internal document from the museum's archives. The museum's creators were um, clear that to avoid all graphic visuals, images that elicit shock and outrage would be to forsake the truth of Nazi evil. They did not want to display victims in a way that would further humiliate them or embarrass their families and descendants or encourage voyeurism. They feared that images of sexual violence and nude corpses might incite, excite sorry, erotic fantasies. Depictions of death, and here's a quote, precisely because its meaning eludes us and because it is universal and ineluctable, um, titillate, fascinate, and compel attention, that viewers should not lose sight of the fact that each of the corpses in a pile was a single, complex, multifaceted human being with parents, families, loved ones, personal dreams and expectations, and thwarted aspirations. So that was the museum's position. They have, in some of the more graphic imagery, from the Holocaust by Bullets, they have a kind of viewing, you know, they put up a, a kind of, because the exhibit's supposed to be for like 12 and up, right? So they have this kind of barrier and they, a warning for the visitors to kind of have the children and for the medical experiments, for instance, which are also quite gruesome, obviously. Do you feel differently about news media? Do you feel, especially in active conflicts, <clears throat> many around the world right now, or in just acts of atrocity in general, do you feel the news media needs to have perhaps a different set of standards? Is handling it appropriate, whether it's video, imagery? What is the news media's position in educating the public in appropriate ways with imagery? <laughs> I 
it's another big question. Um, you know, for the, the longest time in my own classroom, I didn't show images of dead bodies. I just thought, that's a line I don't want to cross. Like, to what end? Um, and in fact, it was it was sort of my own ambivalence around that. Like, well, but, and it, I was selective. You know, I, I taught Holocaust courses, and I didn't show um, dead Jewish bodies. But I showed World War I photos of men in trenches or, you know, um, bombing victims from World War II, and I thought, why am I drawing this line? And it was really that own sort of my my own working through that that led me to to write this book and really think through those those um, those ethical questions. And it does come back to um, what our purpose is in this. Are we looking at this for the little the shock, right, for the sensation. Is the newspaper publishing this because they want to sell more editions than their competitor? Or is there really something educationally, uh, socially valuable to be derived from this image? And I think, you know, one of the challenges we have in trying to address either crises, like immediate transient crises, or these stubborn problems that never go away, is holding people's attention long enough to actually think about something in its real terms. And photographs can be one of those tools that can galvanize opinion around issues. That Alan Curdy photograph completely transformed Canadian policy on immigration, on refugees. Um, will every photograph achieve that? No. But I think part of having a vibrant culture that is sensitive to a political culture and, and a social culture that is sensitive to these issues and is actually thinking about trying to make progress on them is being open to these really uncomfortable uh, images that, that, um, that shine a, a light on the lived experience of this, that, that takes it out of the abstract and makes it something that we can connect. I mean, it's the whole foundation of Slowinski's book, this, you know, that there is a a species solidarity that is built up when we meaningfully engage with the experience of another person and a photograph is the means by which we can do that most effectively. You want to add anything there, Wendy? No, I would just <clears throat> comment that, um, and I was reminded of this today during the exhibit of the Hayes Code. I mean, we've, we, we did have a history of censorship, right, in film and, and whatnot. And I think that a lot of it was also there were, there were norms and kind of conventions and etiquette kind of unspoken about what would be appropriate on the, mid, on the nightly news. You know, what would Walter Cronkite put up? Or like, and, and what was that viewing experience at that time or the ratings that we have, the rating system? So there's always been this history um, in the modern age of visual kind of experience of trying to kind of regulate and censor. Um, and now, all bets are, I mean, it's completely, the, the, the cat's out of the bag, right? I mean, there's, there's no way to control all this. Um, and I guess the other question would be, or the other issue would be, what are the mechanisms in which we view these? Are they these small handheld devices? Are they on the big screen? Are they in your living room? And to think a little bit more about the dissemination of these images um, and, and what that might, what that might do this to these stories, the disappearance of these stories that are behind them. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I don't think it's all that healthy that um, the, the scrolling nature of our tech culture now, um, I don't think that equips us very well, number one, emotionally, number two, uh, to contextualize imagery. I don't think that's a very healthy development, and there's not a fix for that other than deciding sort of as a culture that we're not going to do it that way. I've been in newsrooms that have debated about do we show this video? Do we show this image? You know, a person, a person has died or is dying. And I understand Wendy's point. I mean, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, if the news media had not published the George Floyd video, it would have been out there. I don't think, absent a video, that the impact would have been nearly as large. We could have written a story about what happened to George Floyd in text only. But to see it is undeniable. Well, that's, there are some people who still deny it. There are some people who still deny a lot of things, but not for most. I mean, it was absolutely powerful and necessary, and I think it's healthy for newsrooms to have the bag been in them where the, that, that debate is happening. Um, and I don't think there's, you know, to Valerie's point, these are big questions. There's not easy, you know, sort of quick, cogent answers. I do think they re require reflection, and I think that is healthy. Um, I'm wondering if the, anyone in the audience wants to, before we close, 
uh, jump in with any questions, feel free to put a hand up and, um, and we can certainly take a question or a comment if, if you do. Um, and absent that for now, I just wanted to ask one more question myself, which is we've talked, you've educated this evening about the value of also learning about the photographer, the person behind an, a, a lens. And, and I would just ask you both to maybe talk a little bit about more about that and why that matters and how that helps us as um, sometimes consumers of images to learn a little bit more about a story, if we could. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's not just important to think about the photographer, but to think about the process of photography, and particularly for these historical events that, that Wendy and I study. And again, it's sort of, you know, in the current moment I talk to my students, they take pictures with their with their camera, right? It's it's such a vanishingly cheap, you know, uh, way to to uh, photograph something. They, you know, um, they don't have to do any work. There's barely any decision making involved, and so. But we look at these historical photographs and we think about these men at that time, particularly in wartime. You know, what th this film was an incredibly scarce commodity, and. The decisions involved in taking any single photograph, you know, focusing, accounting for light, just aiming where the camera, uh, you know, what they were to photograph, the work of trying to get prints made, and all this when they themselves were under prohibitions that forbade this kind of imagery being made. And so it speaks volumes to the strength of their desire to to take these kinds of photographs, you know, like the, the series of 12 from Latvia. Um, he had only those 12 frames. He had a, he was in, you know, it was a full day of shooting and he very deliberately chose 12 moments. Nothing about those images is accidental or random or arbitrary. And so simply trying to reconcile with the intention that's built behind these photographs tells us so much about um, the importance of that image to him and, and that informs in such an important way uh, you know, how it is that we receive that. Wendy? Well, like any author, there's, you know, motive, there's a bias. Um, my photographer, Lubomir Shkrovina, well, that was an act of resistance. Um, many of the photographs, I, I believe that the uh, Lafian ones were taken by a German official. Was it Strat or? He's one of them. There's four people. Okay. But we have a whole different category of analysis when it's a perpetrator photograph, a perpetrator gaze, as it were. And the Nazis, you know, they were, you know, triumphant about, for instance, the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto in April 1943. And so what do they do? They create the Stroop Report. The head of the Waffen SS general creates an album with all these terrible captions that are meant to affirm their ideology by, you know, um, denigrating kind of language and so forth about the Jewish vermin, you know, that they pulled out of the ghetto. And that's presented to the superior as a job well done, you know. So the perpetrators, you know, took them in a, as an act of confirmation, affirmation of, of their genocide. Um, so who's taking them? What's their message? What's the, what are they testifying to? What are they witnessing? And, um, you know, resistance. We have underground Jewish photographers in the Wood ghetto taking pictures through their buttonhole. You know, you can see they're clandestine like that, or a few from the Zonderkommando from Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, so the photographer context is super important as far as um, what the objective is, you know, with that image. Uh, Ellen, and, and we do have a question here. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, is that all right? Well, let's go right over here, yeah. Um, hi. Uh, one thing I've been thinking about during this talk, you talked about sort of how social media has changed the way uh, people interpret these uh, photographs of atrocities. I was curious if you had any thoughts on how social media has changed, like the type of photographs that we see and the type that gets published, especially going off of what you both were saying about like sort of photographer intent. Um, is there more potential for photographic misinformation? Is there sort of different, like, different bodies that are producing more of these photographs that reach mainstream coverage now as a result of social media? Yeah, authorship is harder to detect because once they're in circulation, that can kind of fall out of the, the message or the caption or however it's forwarded. They can be manipulated. Obviously, we've been, you know, 
the Soviets were great at airbrushing, you know, as people were knocked off in the Stalinist regime, for instance. Um, so, you know, the manipulation of the image is, is, is really important. We're seeing this now, this whole thing blow up about Kate Middleton, and you have all these people at home, you know, analyzing the photograph. So there's kind of crowdsourcing that goes on in, in the circulation as well, and commentary, what are the, yeah, where is it uploaded, what website is it on, you know, that context. Um, it's just a whole nother way of, of approaching your analysis because it's a different medium and a different moment in time in which it's distributed. So each, you know, kind of era of technology, now digital technology is raising all these kinds of new, new questions. You know, I think sort of the glass half full aspect of this whole issue is sort of the democratization of, 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 uh, news photography, of current event photography, right? That it, it is no longer just newsrooms that are determining uh, which images are seen and not seen. Um, and so, I, it's never all good or all bad, right? So as much as it's it's quite easy to lose authorship, and, and with the rise of AI, I think we're just gonna confront at a you know, ever more intense degree, this problem of is it even, is this photograph even genuine? Is it even real? Um, but along with that has been just the the availability of these images, how rapidly shared they can be, and and that people on the scene, everybody has a camera on them now, right? And so the chance, you know, the opportunity to take what can be a very meaningful image later is that much more broadly shared. And and so along with the challenges come also the the potential advantages. The fact now that the main device for photographing is the phone. And we were talking today with one of the curators, and so we have this mechanism where you can actually film and then watch the, the film at the same time. Um, not like the old days when you took the picture with one apparatus and then you saw it in another medium. Um, and so it's, it's a really incredibly you know, powerful device, and it makes everybody a potential witness to something, right? So every, like ordinary citizens now can be that humanitarian photographer, can take up that kind of charge of, you know, I'm going to document this and, and share it with the world and maybe that will set things straight if, if they're not, if they can get out of that situation. Because we're talking about um, violent contexts, right? So those people taking those photographs um, maybe aren't embedded journalists who have some security, but they're actually in the midst of the event. And just Billy and Valerie's point about the positive negative, I read a, um, <clears throat> there's a conservative columnist that I read pretty regularly and he, he wrote about five years ago and said, until the advent of uh, everyone having a camera and the just the ubiquity of the camera and how often we see these controversial events between police and citizenry, he said, I was more inclined to think that every police report was probably correct. And he said, I don't feel that way anymore. Um, and that has been one of the changes. So and in his view, that was a positive. He just felt like he's seeing the world a little bit more clearly. On the negative side, I've been thinking a lot about authoritarianism, and authoritarians are buoyed by nihilism and by making populations think that there's not really any real truth, that nothing really matters, that there are no real experts or authorities to trust, and therefore, you know, put everything in, in that vessel. Uh, Putin's very good at that, but he's not alone, of course. And um, the more AI convinces us to think that we shouldn't trust anything, which is a natural impulse, the more authoritarians could be buoyed by that, and I'm, I'm deeply concerned about that. I think we've got something up there, too. One more question up here. One more. My question was actually about AI, so that's a great segue. How do you think the use of like AI doctored or like wholly faked and generated images will impact the use of images as primary sources for historical uh, or news research? It's a phenomenal question. <laughs> Um, I'd like to talk about human intelligence instead of artificial intelligence. Um, I'm, more, I'm more concerned about that. And I would just say that I would never, in the classroom, um, source anything from AI in that way and have my students do that and even put them through the exercise of testing it out. I'm, I, it's too soon right now as far as the way it's, you know, the availability of it and, and we haven't like worked through the kind of parameters of it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, at this point, I'm um, more focused on developing human intelligence. To my mind, um, that question highlights the importance of a building like the one we're sitting in right now, right? The, the careful work of archiving these kinds of materials 
that the USHMM does as well, because I fully expect there's going to be some, you know, smoking gun photograph related to the Holocaust that, you know, is used to try and upset this whole history, right? I mean, I can predict that those kinds of images will be made in order to try and disrupt, particularly a changing political culture with a different kind of agenda. Um, and so this is when we uh, recognize the importance of the careful work of historical documentation and archiving and preserving, and so that there is some kind of trusted record that we can uh, rely on. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if technology already does this or will get better at recognizing when an image has been altered using AI. I mean, there's probably uh, tech that can help detect when there's been manipulation, or maybe not. I mean, part of the concern, of course, is when we don't know. And you can ask AI to take photos that we've seen tonight and add a little detail that would cast doubt on any of the points that have made. And AI will do it. Um, and how quickly you, you would be able to spread that. Um, if you say, look at this historical photograph that they've been talking about the Holocaust, but did you notice this? And it's generated by AI, but it looks very authentic, and then it just spreads, and then certainly the fever swamps would be happy to take it and spread it. I don't have a great answer for that. I'm trying not to be an AI curmudgeon. We have a lot of work to do as a culture to figure out how to not be manipulated and how to not be as vulnerable as I currently feel we are. And I wish there was a better answer from my perspective as a journalist. Um, I am so grateful, I hope you are as well, to the wonderful perspective offered by the guests here. So first, can you offer them a round of applause? And I've, of course, been instructed to tell you that the, the event doesn't end right now. They'd uh, love to sign some books and see you, and that's all happening immediately after. Yes, Eliza? So out this door to the right, out by the bookshop, and we have a reception, so please join us. Thank you both. Thanks, everyone. Thank we'll you see all. you at the reception.